Hi, my name is Bill Warren. I'm a principal product manager at Waters Corporation. I've been with Waters for 34 years and a lot has changed over those years. Uh, and I am really excited to provide you with some information from our scientific operations team that's been really focusing on the characterization, both LC as well as LCMS, of adeno associated viruses. Before I begin, I want to call your attention to a very recent uh, technical webinar that was presented by Waters in association with folks from uh, Millipore Sigma, uh, from uh, USP, and other organizations as shown in the slide. If you're interested in listening to this two-hour overview, uh, the link is shown uh, above in red. And today I'm going to primarily give you in 30 minutes kind of the highlights of what Dr. Weibin Chin had presented uh, from the scientific operations team at Waters, talking about some of the innovative ways we have been able to characterize AAVs. As you can well imagine, it's very difficult in 30 minutes to provide you with an overview of uh, uh, gene therapies, how AAVs have been a very uh, enabling technology, how they can be analyzed, but I will do my best, as I said, within 30 minutes. More information, again, is available in that webinar that I have discussed in the previous slide. I'm confident that the information shown in the slide is not new to any of, uh, of you attendees, uh, since uh, gene therapy is a very innovative technology. It has made some incredible advances over the last few years. And today there are a, a variety of drugs that have been approved and many in the pipeline. As I mentioned in the previous slide, there are a variety of, of FDA as well as European approved uh, gene therapy uh, drugs on the market. And there I'm sure are hundreds that are either in clinical uh, phase one, phase two, or phase three uh, investigations throughout the world. And as you also are aware, and again, as I mentioned, that, that webinar that I talked about a few moments ago goes into this in more detail. And there are a variety of, of, of YouTube videos that discuss this, that there are two basic approaches. One is in vivo, one is uh, ex vivo. And again, I'm sure you're familiar with this, and we will be focusing more on the analysis of a very important vector, and that's AAVs. As I've noted, gene therapy attempts to treat genetic disease at the molecular level by correcting what's wrong with those de defective genes. And uh, gene therapy relies on finding, a, obviously, a dependable delivery system all right, to get and carry those genes to either correct the defective gene or to either up or down regulate it. And again, I don't want to go get into that sort of detail. However, to do so, the gene has to be delivered into the target cells and work properly without causing some sort of adverse effect. And delivering those genes that will work correctly for the long term is really one of the biggest challenges today as it relates to gene therapy. And as I mentioned, getting those genes into a, a patient is, is a challenge. And there are a variety of ways of doing that. And normally people think about using a, a vector, all right, to take those genes that have been designed based upon what you're trying to correct and get them into an individual. And there are a variety of vectors that have been looked at. Some of these are retroviruses, adeno-associative viruses, a whole series of things. And again, you have to make sure that that vector can effectively take the gene of interest into the cells of the individual, uh, be able to express that uh, nucleic acid, however, not cause adverse immunogenic responses, which has been the case with some adenoviruses, not cause malignancies, which is a concern if using retroviruses. So again, there are a variety of investigations ongoing to determine the best, the best sort of vector to take a gene into a, a defective cell. We also all recognize that analytics is a really critical role in supporting the development and manufacturing of these viral vectors. This slide is a very simplified view of the early process uh, that involves, at the beginning, a triple infection. So basically taking plasmids and trying to create a, a vector, all right, that has the, nu the correct nucleic acid in it to correct the gene, to, to have the correct information so that that vector can be replicated within a cell, etc. Once that's done, then you have to obviously manufacture sufficient amounts of that vector, all right? You have to purify it, make sure you remove the purification, uh, the, 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 make sure you remove the the uh, undesirable components from just the vector. Formulation is required. You have to make sure that the formulation is stable and then clinical studies. So there are a lot of clinical testing done throughout this process. So this is again another simplified slide trying to uh, show in the beginning, in the middle of the slide, uh, two basic components of a uh, serotherapeutic reagent. And that is the capsid, all right, or the viral vector 
that has to deliver uh, the gene to the cell of interest as well as nucleic acid package within. And there's a variety of analyses that have to be performed uh, in order to create and to be able to create a, a reagent that is effective and one that will pass phase one, two, three clinicals. You have to look at the identity of the nucleic acid. You have to look at the capsid. You have to characterize uh, the titer of that, the potency, uh, how well will it be expressed in the cell line. And again, there are complete seminars on this particular area. And to the right are some of the technologies, and we're going to be talking about those uh, used to characterize um, the viral vector. And in particular, we're going to be talking about some LC techniques and LCMS to help characterize these vectors. This tier tilt slide provides you with a little more depth as to the sorts of analyses, the analytical challenges there are in developing effective gene therapeutic products. And as I said, there's the aspect of looking at the vector, identity, purity, stability, potency. There's also CMP uh, initiatives that have to be considered. And again, there are entire workshops and discussion and team meetings on this whole variety of, of challenges because these are really innovative drugs. And at this point, a lot of the regulatory agencies really are working with, with scientists and companies to develop what would be appropriate analytical methods to make sure that these reagents are safe and effective. So as I showed in a few slides previous to this uh, to, to slide 11, uh, there are a variety of different vectors that have been considered to be used uh, to deliver uh, genes for therapeutic uh, uh, purposes. Uh, and the one that we're going to be talking about today, which is seems to be one that is uh, quite popular, is adeno-associated viruses. There's a variety of reasons for that. One is the fact that it is not immunogenic, all right, which would be an issue, and that's what some of the concerns were initially with cell therapies. They were using adenovirus, and they were getting incredibly uh, strong immune responses to that virus and cytokine releases. And in fact, I think one of the first individuals who was treated with a cell therapeutic using adenoviruses succumbed to the fact of the incredible, uh, undesirable immune response. So long story short, AAVs are, are being uh, used today. We're going to be talking about those. But let's take a look at an AAV, and let's take a look in the slide to the far left, and that's a monoclonal antibody. And I think everybody's very familiar with them. Their molecular weight is around 150,000 Daltons. Compare that to an AAV, which is significantly larger, which offers analytical challenges. Uh, AAVs primarily consist of about 60 different subunit proteins that make the icosahedral uh, capsid. Uh, there is a single um, amino acid uh, change can dr dramatically affect, again, a single amino acid change in that capsid protein can really affect its biological activity. Uh, if that uh, capsid proteins become deaminated, phosphorylated, etc., that can all affect its activity. And these are the things that that, uh, that organizations are trying to determine, uh, cause and effect. If something is modified on the capsid protein, does it have an effect? So again, I don't want to get into a lot of detail here. There are incomplete seminars on this. But again, it is a challenge to be able to look at something that is significantly larger than what most of us are familiar with working with, with things such as monoclonal antibodies. So as I mentioned a few moments ago, there are techniques that have to be performed to look at its purity, all right, to look at its composition of those capsids. So let me just start off with the far left. So for purity, a traditional method that's been used is ultra, analytical ultracinification. It's rather laborious. You're going to be separating the, again, I should have said that sometimes the challenge is that you can, you can manufacture capsids such as AAV, but the challenge is to determine whether those capsids have the, the desired single-stranded nucleic acid package within. So you sometimes have a population of full and empty capsids. So one way traditionally to do that, uh, to look at the degree of full versus empty capsids, is to utilize ion exchange chromatography or ultracinification. That's the second one down. Another challenge is if those AAVs have aggregated, that may not be desirable. All right. So again, ultracinification has been a technique to look at that. But Analytical ultracinification is not a, a relatively simple process to do. It's relatively low throughput. It does require a certain degree of expertise on the, on the analyst uh, side to be able to interpret and run and get uh, correct data. So again, we'll be talking about using size exclusion chromatography to be able to look at aggregated versus um, non-aggregated plasmids. Purity, uh, I think all of us in the lab at one time or another have run SDS page gels, and certainly uh, those can be used to look at AAVs. And what I hadn't mentioned is normally AAVs consist of three proteins, 
all right, three types of proteins. Uh, there are different serotypes, which we'll talk about in a moment. And the ratio is like one to one to like 50, all right? So S, uh, SDS page can do that, can separate them. You can quantitate them. However, we'll be talking in a few moments about using reverse phase LC and adding mass spectrometry to that so that not only do you see a peak, but you can actually determine its molecular weight and be able to determine whether it, if it's off from what you think, could that be due to a, a dephosphorylation or deamidation? So kind of a powerful technique and certainly Certainly the most powerful technique in terms of analysis, LC-based analysis, is peptide mapping, as you know from your experiences perhaps looking at monoclonal antibodies. It is certainly the most comprehensive way to look at a, at a protein or a, a capsid proteins, but it has its challenges, which we'll talk about in a few moments. So Wattis has been uh, involved in uh, size exclusion chromatography for, for many years, all right? And most recently, we've been developing chemistries and columns to accurately look at monoclonal antibody aggregates, monomers, and fragments. And again, we have complete topics and seminars on that topic. But however, one of our chief consulting chemists uh, about a year ago asked himself, well, could you use SCC to look at something that is re really larger than an antibody, an AAV? And uh, I'm really excited to show you some of the results that he's generated. Before doing that, uh, there perhaps are a few of you who aren't familiar with the principles of size exclusion chromatography, but it's pretty straightforward. Uh, it's an isocratic separation, which means you are not running a gradient, you're not concentrating anything, and it primarily uh, the basis of the separation is determined by the size and solution, which roughly correlates to the molecular weight, but more importantly, the size and solution of the various components in the mixture. The biggest species, uh, if they are too large, then <laughs> Let me go. Let me take that back a bit. Uh, SEC uh, columns are packed with particles. They have pores and certain pore volume. So if the analyte is bigger than the pores, it will basically go through the column unretained and comes out first. So in SEC, big ones come out first. The smaller species will get into the pores, come out of the pores, go into the pores, come out of the pores, and come off last. It is not a gradient separation. It is not the highest resolving technique compared to things like peptide mapping and reverse phase. However, it certainly can adequately resolve things that differ in molecular weight or size and solution by about twofold. And this technique is something that, again, Dr. Kosa thought could we use it to look at AAVs. And I have some exciting data to show with you. Remember so I said that SEC columns are packed with particles, and those particles have different pores. So if you look at the top left, you'll see, uh, in theory, uh, um, scanning EMs of, of four different SEC particles that we've generated at Waters. All right, 300 angstrom, 500 angstrom, that's the average pore size, 800 and 1,000 angstrom. And when we see 1,000 angstrom, it's basically determined by looking at at mercury infusion, and again, it's an analytical technique that can actually determine what the average pore volume, oh, sorry, pore size is, all right? Now, let's take a look at, we have a 450 angstrom particle. That's the far, far right. So, in theory, based upon the analytical technique, it's 450 angstrom pores. However, if you look at the surface of the particle and you actually measure the diameter of some of these pores, you'll see that the diameter, in this case, the little yellow box is uh, 1,800 angstrom. So in theory and in practice, you know, an AAV that's only nearly 20 nanometers from an aggregate that could be 40 or 60 should be able to be separated. And sure enough, it can. So that's what we show in this slide. So we've taken one of the water's uh, 450 angstrom pore size SEC columns, a 4.6 by 30 centimeter. We have basically injected the AAV onto the column. Remember, the big ones come out first, all right? So you'll see around at six minutes in the chromatogram, you'll see a blip, and then you'll see a major blip, blip around seven minutes. We've added a light scattering detector so we can actually determine the molecular weight. And sure enough, we found out that we are able to accurately and adequately separate the aggregate from the monomer. And again, the uh, light scattering detector as shown here, the data, it's an overlay, the data shows what the molecular weight is. So so again, uh, proof was a very exciting, uh, these first experiments where Steve says, you know, I think we can separate these things. And sure enough, uh, we're able to on our existing 450 angstrom pore size column for the reasons I've just described. And that is, if you look at the particle on the surface, the pores are bigger than 450 angstrom, thereby you're able to do the separation. 
So again, I'm going to show you an application note that goes over how we've optimized the separation. In a moment, you can download it and get some details because we really don't have time to go over that today. But he basically looked at using different counter ions, using different pHs, and trying to develop a separation that looked pretty, pretty good and robust, reproducible. And that's shown uh, again in the bottom, the bottom right. However, uh, he very quickly realized that. <laughs> Manufacturing AAVs is not trite, and it's you, you, you can't get really a large concentration of them, unlike antibodies, you can make you know milligram amounts. With AAVs, it, it's another story. So what uh, Dr. Kosa tried to do was to say, well, you know what? We know that we can see these at 280. However, how about if we used a fluorescence detector, looking at 280 for the excitation and 350 for the emission? And sure enough, as you see in this slide, you get much better signal to noise. So again, that's one of the uh, things that Dr. Kosa had, had, had learned in the process, and we've shared that information with other members of the scientific operations group looking at, uh, at these capsids at the intact protein level and or uh, a peptide mapping, again, utilizing fluorescence. Again, a, a, a useful thing for one to consider. Now, fortunately, we're able to work with some outside um, sources that could provide us with AAVs, all right, of, of different serotypes. And again, the, the seminar I referred to at the beginning of this presentation talks about different AAVs and some of these different serotypes. Uh, the antigens have different tropisms for different types of cells. So if you want to basically make a cell therapy for a kidney cell, I believe it's AAV9, all right? So again, that's why there are different serotypes. These are in nature. These aren't things that were created in a laboratory. They exist in nature. And again, uh, scientists can, can basically engineer different types of AAVs with different serotypes for different um, tropisms for different cells. So what I really want to show here is that when you look at AAVs of these different serotypes, in all cases, he was able to separate both the aggregate all right, which big ones come out first from the monomer. And interestingly, at levels that are in many cases less than 1%, which is not surprising because obviously if one is making an AAV and formulating it, you do not want to have undesirable aggregates because it may not be able to be taken up into the cell as well as the monomer. So again, there's a whole science around making an effective AAV vector. But again, one of the critical quality attributes that people monitor is the degree of aggregation. And again, this slide shows you the ability to separate them using a fluorescence detector and getting really good separations and really good reproducibility. So this is uh, the summary slide. Again, we, we showed you using SEC with UV in malls, all right, to confirm what those early eluding species were. We talked about, at this point, the ability um, to, we're going to talk about in a moment, the ability to look at, at full and empty, uh, empty capsids, and that's a, a, a different topic uh, that, let me say this right now. Um, <laughs> it's impossible at this point to use SEC to separate a capsid from a capsid that has the genome inside. We're unable to do that. The size and solution is not twofold off. However, we are able to do that using a different technique, in particular anion exchange chromatography. So again, SEC can really separate uh, aggregated from non-aggregated capsids. All right, we talked about very low concentrations of these uh, analytes, and thereby using fluorescence detector to give you better signal to noise. And what's shown in this slide, which I didn't mention, is that, you know, Dr. Kosa did a lot of work looking at 1.7 micron particles, 2.5, 3.5. And we found that the most robust column for this separation is to use a 3.5 micron particle, which we have available. Again, we have the Xbridge based BEH 450 and 1.7, right? 2.5, 3.5. Again, we are recommending at this point use of a 3.5 particle in those SEC columns. And again, I know in 30 minutes, I want to make sure I cover the highlights of, of the work that the PSYOPs team have done. Again, here is an application note which was published a couple of weeks ago, and it's going, going to go over basically everything I've just said, but give you some more details. So I call your attention to it. Uh, you can download it from the Waters website, and the part number for that literature is shown in this slide. As I said a moment ago, uh, although SEC can separate uh, AAV aggregates for monomers, uh, it's really impossible at this point. I've never seen a separation of, an, uh, of a capsid with in one without its nucleic acid. However, there was literature pieces uh, that suggested that if the capsid had nucleic acid in them, for whatever reason, the charged surface of a capsid with nucleic acid would be different 
from the surface charge of the capsid without the nucleic acid contained inside. That is full versus empty. And if the surface charge is different, as you know, in ion exchange chromatography or ion exchange chromatography separates things based upon the surface charge. So what uh, Dr. Yang had begun investigating, well, could we separate some of these full versus empty caps using anion exchange chromatography? And I'm really pleased to show you some of her results in the next couple of slides. And at the end of this presentation, she does have an application note that you can get, again, much more information. So as I alluded to earlier, there's no one analytical technique used to analyze anything, whether it's an antibody, uh, fusion protein, bispecific protein, or in this case, AAVs. There are a variety of techniques. Some of these things are orthogonal, complementary. And looking at full versus empty capsids, people have used ultra analytical ultracentrification because their, their, their density will be different if it has nucleic acid or not. But as I mentioned, that is not a very easy technique to use. Uh, it does require a certain degree of, of, of technical expertise. Another technique is to use spectrometry, because as you can imagine, uh, and as you know, nucleic acids will have a greater absorption at 260 versus 280. The capsid proteins have more of an absorption at 280, and by looking at 280 260 ratios, and there's been some papers to talk about this, all right, that you can you can approximate the degree of of, of nucleic acid in a capsid versus uh, capsids that are free. Another technique, which is something that is very interesting, is called charge density mass spectrometry. Uh, it's, it's kind of like in some ways using a, an ion trap. However, you can actually allow single ions to go through to the mass spec detector and look at their masses. So in theory, you can actually determine the mass of every individual capsid that blows through the mass spec and determine its mass, therefore determining whether it is full or empty. Uh, it's not a technique that uh, is a commercial available product at this time. There are some prototypes out there and some of the companies that we've been dealing with have been using that. However, today we're going to be talking about using ion exchange chromatography. And as I said a few moments ago, uh, and as for those who aren't familiar with with anion exchange chromatography, uh, the resin has positive charges on it. In this case, it's a quaternary amine. All right, so a full capsid, as shown in this slide, will have maybe more negative charges because of nucleic acids, the phosphates you know, within the nucleotides within the capsid. Some of those evidently uh, result in the surface being slightly more negatively charged than an empty capsid, and therefore you can separate them based upon the differences in surface charges using a gradient of either increasing salt, pH, etc. In this case, we just use a gradient of increasing salt concentration. All right, and the far right basically shows you uh, some of the examples. And again, as Dr. Kosa showed, we've looked at using both UV detection as well as fluorescence. We get much better to, to noise with fluorescent, but again, there are two options for people to consider using. So again, thanks to a couple of our collaborating companies, we were able to get uh, what they believed were empty caps, it's full caps, and we we're able to create a mixture of the two. And basically separating on our protein pack high-res Q column, it's a solid core particle, surface coating, very high resolution, and the conditions are shown here. And sure enough, uh, she's able to separate the empty versus the full caps, it's utilizing a relatively straightforward and simple procedure. And what's nice about uh, liquid chromatography is you can get really nice and reproducible quantitation. And again, because we received from the uh, uh, a collaborator a capsids of known amounts of empty full, and again, you can also, I forgot to mention this, people have also tried using scanning electron microscopy and actually look at the capsids and determine which ones are full versus empty. Long story short, she created basically a mixture at different concentrations and checking them on the anion exchanges, and really she shows really nice uh, linearity, all right? So again, in theory and in practice, uh, this technique can be used to separate uh, both empty versus full capsids and also provide you with some quantitation in terms of the amount of each. Now remember a few moments ago, we, we mentioned that there are different serotypes of, of capsids and those different serotypes have different tropisms for different types of cells. So unfortunately, at this point, we only had AAV empty capsids, AAV 1, 2, 5, 6, 8, 9. However, there was one mixture of, of empty E versus F full. So we show here, all right, that we can separate at the very bottom if we knew we had a mixture. But what's important about this slide is to say that these different serotypes on the anion exchanger don't all come off at the same point. So let me let me go and say that one more time. 
all the capsids, right, the black, the blue, the red, the purple, the pink, and the green, they were all empty capsids. We ran the same column, the same gradient, and again, they're not all coming off at the same amount of salt. And that suggests that the various serotypes have different degrees of, of amino acids, different compositions. And again, if they have, we'll say, fewer uh, basic amino acids, such as arginine and, and uh, lysine, they will come off in a lower salt concentration. So what this slide says is if you're going to use this technique, you really have to optimize the gradient for each of these different serotypes. And once you've optimized it, then you can certainly be able to separate both the empty and the full uh, utilizing a gradient similar to what, what, what I had shown in the previous slide. So again, as you can imagine, in 30 minutes, it's difficult to provide you with all of the details, what went on behind some of the science. And again, uh, I think there are about 10 application chemists at Waters working, not full time, but a lot of, of their time looking at AAV analysis and, and gene therapy analysis. So again, this work's been going on for, I think, about a year or so. So she's got some really good examples, good results. And again, it's an application note that will give you more information if so required. As I mentioned previously, in 30 minutes, it's very difficult to cover all the scientific data that Waters has generated. Uh, coming very soon uh, will be an additional module talking about the characterization of uh, intact proteins from AAV capsids, as well as taking those intact proteins and digesting them and doing things as we refer to them as peptide mapping. And Dr. Shimo Zhang is in the process of putting together this module, which has some very, very interesting data. I'll give you a quick summary in, in a few slides uh, to talk about some of the work she's done. Again, as I said, looking at intact proteins as well as peptide mapping from recombinant AAV capsids. So I want to thank you for your attendance. I know it may have gone a few minutes over 30. Um, however, uh, hopefully I have successfully shown you some of the SEC-based separations to look at AAV aggregates uh, and non-aggregated species. We spent some time talking about the analysis using anion exchange chromatography, uh, looking at, again, capsids that may be empty versus capsids that have nucleic acids contained within them. Uh, we also spoke about the fact that the manufacture and production of AAVs results in uh, relatively low concentrations. In order to see these, uh, we have been effectively using fluorescence detection. And as I said a moment ago, we do have some preliminary findings uh, utilizing a uh, innovative ion pair reagent uh, referred to as difluoroacetic acid. And we've used that to analyze intact uh, AAV proteins using reverse phase chromatography. And as well, we've been doing some very, very interesting peptide mapping. And again, there are preliminary findings available. If you want inf more information, uh, feel free to contact us. As I said at the beginning of the slide, you know, I've been with Waters for quite a few years. I am uh, the principal product manager. I'm familiar with all the chemistries, but it's people such as those within our scientific operations group. And this is a partial list of the people who've been working in, in Milford, Waters Milford headquarters on AAV analysis. All right, as well as other uh, innovative uh, technologies that could be related to uh, cell, therape cell therapeutics. We also want to thank Sanofi Bio uh, Reliance for, for working with us and providing us with some samples. So hopefully I've, I've uh, provided you with a, an overview of, of what we have done and some of the things we hope to do. We hope you found this presentation uh, interesting. And again, if you have any questions, feel free to contact me and I will certainly and put you in contact with the appropriate scientific person to answer a question that I would admit at this point, I probably would not be technically able to answer. So again, thank you for your attention. Have a great day. Stay safe. <music>